Welcome to the Old Man of Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 176, Joe Missoula, uh, the return of our coaching series. I so enjoy doing these coaching series, and for me, it's really interesting to get sort of inside the mind of a coach and all that goes into coaching. Um, and we talk with Joe about X's and O's a little bit, um, but Joe is a big on on mindset. And we get into a lot on mindset, both as a coach and how he sort of uh, views the mindset of players and, and kind of connects on a on a granular level with each player uh, based on mindset. Um, full disclosure, I flew up to Boston on Friday to interview Joe, sat, sat in his office, uh, had a lovely chat pre and post interview, um, had no hint whatsoever that any trade was about to go down. And then, of course, Sunday, we find out uh, Drew Holiday is going to the Celtics. Uh, So I don't necessarily think uh, we missed anything, um, but we didn't get his reaction, uh, of course, and his insight to this trade. Uh, So we don't have that. We covered the Damian Lillard trade and the Drew Holiday trade extensively on the Old Man and the Three Things on Monday with the guys from the dunker spot. Uh, if you want to hear uh, a longer version uh, and, our, and our, our full analysis of those two trades, uh, you can find The Old Man of the Three Things on Amazon Music. You can find it on the Rundry Plus app. Uh, so go give that a listen. Uh, for that show, by the way, I have a little bit of an announcement. For that show, The Old Man of the Three Things, uh, which comes out every Monday. Uh, look, we have to do uh, 44-ish episodes of The Old Man of the Three Things. Uh, we are excited to announce that Dunker Spot guys are going to do half of those shows with me. And Tim Legler, Tim Legler, one of the goats in NBA analysis, has agreed to do roughly half of those episodes. So you guys will be getting uh, some amazing NBA analysis every Monday during the season from myself, the Dunker Spot, and Tim Legler. Uh, you can subscribe on Amazon Music, Amazon Prime, Wondery Plus, whatever. Uh, Old Man of the Three Things, please go check that out. We're excited to bring you those episodes for those of you who watch the show on YouTube. Uh, as normal, we will continue to put out a, a couple breakout videos, one or two breakout videos from all of the Old Man of the Three Things episodes uh, on Mondays uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so go hit subscribe on that. Uh, on the trade, wanted to get into championship odds for a second. And uh, this segment is is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Um, so I want to look at how these odds have shifted because to me, uh, the Celtics and the Bucks were already tier one championship contenders. Tier one. Uh, I had them along with the Lakers, the Suns, and the Nuggets as my five teams that I felt had the best chance going into the season to win a championship. And there's a number of other teams that are in that tier two. Uh, I, I probably put the Warriors right outside tier one. Um, but those five teams, to me, I, I, I think are, are built the best for a championship as of right now. Interestingly enough, the next three teams with the highest odds on DraftKings Sportsbook, Denver Nuggets plus 500, Phoenix Suns plus 600, LA Lakers plus 1,200. Hmm. Next team after that, Golden State Warriors plus 1,300. So, the DraftKings Sportsbook tends to agree with me. Or maybe it's the other way around. I'm not sure. And then, of course, you add these two amazing players. Damian Lillard, one of the greatest players of all time, going to the Bucks to pair with Giannis. Uh, incredibly excited about the pick and roll with Giannis. I don't think Giannis has ever had a pick and roll partner like Damian Lillard. And, of course, I don't think Damian Lillard has had a pick and roll partner like Giannis. Uh, Dame's ability to stretch the defense, bringing the bigs higher bringing the pickup point higher, what is that going to do? That's going to create more space for Giannis in any sort of role scenario. And we all know Giannis is a willing passer, great playmaker. Uh, to me, this trade, it benefits Dame, it benefits Giannis. Giannis will be even more efficient than he's been uh, by playing with Damian Lillard. Uh, so their offense is going to have a number of options. Uh, you can run an inverted pick and roll. Dame screening for Giannis, uh, which you know they've done in the past. I don't think anybody as good as Dame has screened for Giannis yet in his career. Uh, that's how good Dame is. And then on the Celtics side, um, 
was really high on them post Porzingis trade. They essentially traded uh, Marcus Smart for Drew Holiday and added Porzingis. I mean, that's one way to look at it, right? When you think about how they've played over the last two seasons, when they've made these deep uh, playoff runs, of course, the finals in 2022 and, and Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals this year, um, their lineup optionality is really interesting to me. Really interesting. Uh, they can play small. They can play big. Uh, Joe talks about that uh, during our interview, uh, playing those two bigs together. Uh, another thing he talks about is is uh, sort of the shot variance and shot selection maybe looking a little different than it did last year as he looks to exploit some switching matchups and, and getting Porzingis, getting Tatum, getting Brown, uh, more post-up opportunities. So for both these teams, just really, really high. I, I, and, and the Blazers, I think, got a great return. But the Bucks and the Celtics are the beneficiary of this, uh, of course. Uh, when the odds open on DraftKings Sportsbook, um, the Celtics opened at plus 500. The Bucks opened at plus six, 650. Uh, following the, the Lillard trade, uh, the Celtics stayed at plus 500. The Bucks moved to plus 390. They were the favorites. And as of right now, following the Drew trade, these are the two co-favorites to win the NBA championship, both at plus 400 on DraftKings Sportsbook. Um, equal odds as well, plus 180 to win the Eastern Conference Final. I think the real loser in this trade, the real losers, I should say, in this trade uh, are the Miami Heat, uh, of course, who didn't get Damian Lillard, and the Philadelphia 76ers. So the Portland Trailblazers executed two trades where... Two of the teams that were contending for the Eastern Conference last year, they lost out, right? Uh, you know, there wasn't a three-team trade, as I suggested last week, where Drew ends up in uh, Philly with Maxi and James goes to the Clippers and, you know, picks and players gets rerouted to Portland. That didn't happen. Uh, the Bucks and the Celtics got better, and uh, it just got reported that uh, James Harden might miss media day. So, to me... The Heat and the Sixers are are the real losers in this trade. Uh, I don't see a scenario outside of uh, you know health and injuries where uh, the Celtics and the Bucks aren't the two best teams in the Eastern Conference this year. Uh, that's how good these two teams look on paper. I'm not saying the players and the teams are losers. I'm saying they've lost in this scenario. Okay, there's a big difference. They're not losers. Joel Embiid is not a loser. Okay, Jimmy Butler's not a loser. I'm not saying that. I want to be clear. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JJ to sign up. New customers can bet just $5 and take home $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas. Licensee partner, Golden Nugget, Lake Charles, Louisiana. 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball for eligibility terms and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Lots to get into with Joe Missoula. Uh, love chatting with him. Uh, really, really fascinated. And, and I've known Joe now for uh, a year. And uh, we get into all of that in our conversation. Uh, let's get to our interview with Joe Missoula. All right, let's welcome in Boston Celtics coach Joe Missoula. Joe, thanks for doing this, man. Oh, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Um, little background first. So we were supposed to do this in July. And as I was flying up here this morning, I was like, you know, it's fitting we're doing it now, this weekend in particular, um, because it was a year ago. I'm telling my perspective on oh, this. Yeah. It was a year ago. I was coming up to Boston. I had this trip planned. Uh, my wife was out of town. I was going to take my kids to my best friend's house in Cohasset. And uh, I called Austin Ainge and I said, hey, dude, can Sunday morning, can we go play golf at, uh, at Old Sandwich? He's like, absolutely. would love to host you. Friday night. I get a call from Brad 
you had been named uh, interim head coach. Yep. And uh, you happened to join the foursome and try to convince me to come join the staff. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like most of that four and a half hour round and the subsequent lunch was us talking about what my role would be and all this stuff. And maybe I did ask you this, but uh, those few days from being named interim head coach to the start of training camp, media day, all that stuff. What were your emotions? What was going through your head during those those few days? Well, first I thought we had a chance at getting you. And then we go through the clubhouse to walk out and you're like, so when does training camp start? And I was like, uh, Monday. <laughs> and it was Friday. And so I was like, this guy put all this thought into wanting to coach. He doesn't even know when the season starts. It was, it was, training camp started Tuesday. I go, what did he be here? It was a Sunday morning. And you go oh, it was Sunday. It was Sunday. Yeah, yeah. And you go Tuesday. And I go, huh. huh. And I was like, he ain't coming. <laughs> no, I, it was funny because I caught myself mid round and I, 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 I wasn't wasting your time. I was, no, I, I, I knew you were. Like, no. I, I gave it some serious thought. And when you called me when Damon left yeah. in, in the middle of the season, I gave mm -hmm. that some serious thought too. Um, but I caught myself mid round because Austin goes, what, what other golf stuff do you have coming up? <laughs> and I go, I'm playing Pine Valley on the 17th. Yes. And I, and then I was like, I looked at you and you kind of were like, oh, this dude. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good time. I knew you weren't wasting your time. Like I, I thought it was an authentic, I appreciate it. Look, like the decision to go into coaching is hard. Like there's people go into coaching for different reasons, you know? And so it, it, it's, it's definitely a choice that has a major impact on every facet of your life it affects everybody especially when you have wife kids um and so just the fact that we got to spend that time together i thought it was it, it, it paid off in the long run and i think it will make for like a better conversation today for um, sure for sure so back to your emotions back yeah to your so like emotions. you know it's funny that it's I, I never do well when i have a lot of time to think like that's like where i'm not great um in some areas. And so the fact that got the call, boom, training camp in four days, it's almost like you go into like survival mode. Like you just, you don't have time to think about anything except like what's the most important thing right now. You know, like this training camp, we, you know, we had our coaches retreat and stuff. And like, I drew up the practice plans like a month ago and then I deleted the document and it's like, we redid it yesterday. Whereas last year it was just like, all right, we're just, these are the most important things on day one. Like we we're just doing that. Um, these are the objectives. And so it's almost like you just kind of went into like, you don't have time for anything other than figuring out what's most important and going from there. So it actually kind of helped me a little bit in year one of like, if I went into a situation in year one and I had to think a lot, I think it would have been a little bit like, ah, do we do this? Do we do that? Um, so it wasn't too bad. Um, I think it was more about how was it going to affect my wife, my family? Cause I get home, really? I get home. It's like 10 o'clock. Uh, I had to meet with Brad. And, uh, you know, she's upstairs, like, making the bed. And I walk in, and I just have a look on my face. And I'm like, you know, we're the interim coach of the Celtics. And she's like, shut the F up. And I was like, no, we are, really. And, like, she didn't even know what to say. Um, and uh, usually when something like that happens it, and it kind of throws into your family, like, it can be negative. But I think that situation, from that moment on the entire year, it brought our marriage closer and our family closer. And I thought it was, that was like the coolest part. Is she, is she from New England too? No, she's from West Virginia. Okay. All yeah. right. Got yeah. it. Got it. So you're, 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 you're saying because of the timing, it actually was a benefit. So your head wasn't spinning at all. It wasn't spinning at all. Like I knew, I knew I was going to struggle. Like I wasn't sitting there saying like, oh, I'm ready. I got this all figured out. Like I was like, okay, like I know I'm going to screw up here. I know like, I know I'm not going to be perfect. I know we're going to practice isn't going to go great some days, but I think what made it a little bit more comfortable was I had been here for three years. I had, a, I had, I had built relationships with the players, with the organization. I had worked for Brad as an assistant. And so I was able to use a lot of the data that I already had to kind of just go forward. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't definitely like, Oh, I got this all figured out. I was like, okay, like this is going to be really hard. Um, but I, I tried not to think too far ahead. Like I was just like, I'm only going to worry about now to training camp ends. And then when training camp ends, We'll just figure out like the first 20 games and then we'll see what happens. Like, I didn't know we were going to, I don't even know how many, what we won. Like, what was our record? I have no idea. 57? No, I'm saying that, that like oh. 20 game mark, oh, we were yeah, like, yeah. we went on that run. Right. I had no idea that was going to happen. Yeah. Like, so it's almost. I think you were 18 and two, weren't you? Some, something like that. Yeah, but yeah. like, it's when you have no expectations, it actually makes things a little bit easier sometimes as opposed to having expectations and then your expectations not getting met. So I just sat in on your post practice, uh, jujitsu session with your jujitsu coach yeah. and he talked about managing expectations and i i want to touch on that in a little bit okay but i do i do want to get to one other thing during this sort of period of time which is basically 
uh, if we're being honest, you can you can define crisis however you want, but in some ways, uh, there was a there was a crisis. Your yeah. team's coming off uh, an NBA Finals uh, appearance. Uh, the head coach is is been suspended. Um, this young guy's taken over, and I think part of being a head coach uh, is is crisis management. And so, how did you sort of approach the crisis management part with the players with your team? I think the first part was like just be as vulnerable as you can right up front. And I was just like, I just tried to be as vulnerable as I can. Like, listen, I was behind the bench coach. Behind the bench coach, I'm an interim. Um, I don't have any experience being a head coach, but what I do know is I've built great relationships. What I, what I I think I've built relatively good relationships with each person in this room. I know who you are as people. I know who you are as players, and I know what type of character you have. And so I'm going to rely on that more than anything else. And we're not going to be able to move forward. If you got, if the, the team the, as a whole, the locker room doesn't drive the engine for this. And I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my best um, to fill in the gaps of, you know, where I think I can help. Um, but we don't have the transition without the, those guys. And so I thought I had to just like, just be as vulnerable and open as I can. I love that approach. There's a, there's a humility that's required in doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, they're really good at what they do. Like they play the game at a really, really high level. Yeah. And at that time, I wasn't really good at being a head coach in the NBA because I had never done it. So like, why would I go in with the expectation of like, we're going to do it this way? And we didn't necessarily, you know, we, we worked together, but I, I, 95% came from the character uh, of our locker room. Like the guys that have been here a long time, the new guys that joined, like I, that, that's kind of what I leaned on. So we're going to get a little bit into your background in a second, but you had been a head coach before yeah. at, at Fairmont State, a D2 school in West Virginia. Um, but you go from being the fourth assistant to the head coach in the NBA of arguably one of the two most visible, well-known franchises, uh, you know, potentially in the world in terms of basketball, but certainly in this, in this country. And there had to have been some surprises. Like there, there's a, the obvious stuff. Like, I got to figure out the X's and O's. I got to mm -hmm. figure out the defensive, offensive strategies and philosophies and all yeah, that. Yeah. Um, what did, what surprised you the most about being a head coach? What were like the hardest adjustments you had to make? Bit, by far, the hardest adjustment was like people gave a shit who you were. Like I just couldn't understand why that was something. And you know, but you're I, the head coach of the Celtics. <laughs> but dude. that's what people would say all the time. Like so, I get that now. Like I understand that it does come with a a different type of platform. And, and, you know, so like the fact that we're here today is like a huge step for me. So like the hardest adjustment was I just became, I'm an emotionally guarded person. I'm, I'm an introvert. Um, you know, it's funny. I was saying, I was telling this yesterday to our organization is, you know, I, I, I wasn't like standoffish. I would walk by people. I would say hi. Like I built good relationships with people, but I got to a point where like I would come in through the service elevator so that I could come in on five R and just go straight to the film room and I go straight to the film room to the court back into the film room and then take the service elevator back. This is home. when you were an assistant? Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and like, I was just doing my job, staying out of the way. And like, I think Al Horford said this to me one day. He was like, yeah, when you were an assistant, like I, I wouldn't even look, if we were on the court, I, w I would never, I wouldn't talk. I would never talk. I would only talk to the people I was assigned to working with. I didn't like do anything except what I was supposed to do. And, you know, then I go from like just hanging around the facility to now like, Every, I'm running the facility and it's like, and I wasn't quite ready to take ownership in that department yet because it was like, I was going to have to let myself go emotionally. I was going to have to put myself, there's a difference between being vulnerable with a locker room full of guys that you're working with and then being vulnerable with an entire organization and being vulnerable with the world. And I wasn't ready for that part yet. And that was hard. Yeah. So, so what, what's, I, I mean, I, I, I would, it's funny cause I, I'm. I host a podcast and I go on television and, you know, I am certainly out there and I am opinionated often. I'm naturally very introverted yeah. and it took years and years of like personal growth and evolution. And honestly, I think the biggest growth that I had in terms of that was <clears throat> when I played for the Clippers and high pressure, more responsibility, big market, um, you know, a visible team. And it was like, um, it was in some ways a matter of survival, a mat, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was like, I, I have to evolve as a human. Um, but it's not, it was not an easy process. Yeah. What's, what's been 
in terms of this evolution, because you're sitting here now uh, agreeing to do a podcast with me. Thank you. But what's sort of been the battle yeah. in, in terms of evolving into someone who can lead a facility, lead a locker room, talk to the media, um, speak on the good stuff and the bad stuff? Mm -hmm. So I think the first battle is like one thing I'm conscious of is you never want to become like a storyline or, or be attention. And so like when, when we first, when you first asked me to do the podcast, I was like, ah, I'm just not ready yet. Like you start, how, every action I do now is going to be perceived in some type of way, right? So you try to be as thoughtful as you can of like, does, is this action drawing attention to me personally, or is it drawing attention to the Celtics or is it drawing attention to my family? Like, you know, so you, you have to ponder each decision and make sure that it's drawing attention to the right things. Um, the other thing that's a like a balance is like, I never want to become something other than like just a guy that coaches the Celtics. Like it's the NBA. It's about the players. It's about the history. It's about the tradition of this organization. I never want to be, I never even want to think about being like that. And so, and don't get me wrong, it'll never happen. So, um, <laughs> but I still like think about that stuff. Like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to draw attention to myself. Um, and so I think that's the first part, right? Yeah. It's like, how can you maintain a level? You no, know like I, when people say like they're humble, like I, I battle with pride, I battle with insecurities, I battle with stuff, but I like to try to understand what humility is. And I never want to like lose sight of the so, idea of humility. I, I'm fascinated by this. But I hate when people say like, oh, I'm, I'm humble. It's like, I'm, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, yeah. I'm not humble in every area of my life. Like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this for a second. So, so for the, for the listener, the viewer, we are going to get into a ton of basketball stuff. Um, Joe and I, we, we were talking beforehand and it was a halfway therapy session. And I, I, I'm curious about that because we were talking about insecurities earlier. Yeah. The insecurities. What did you learn about your own insecurities and your want to be a head coach? Oh, you have, they, they, you, without even, you can't control if they're going to come up. And what I learned is like, it's the same thing with fear. Like one of my friends um, who I talk to a lot, I texted him one day and it's like, is it like, why do I feel a level of fear heading into this game? And he was like, it's not the fear that's the issue. It's the fear t towards the fear. It's like panicking that you are, you should have a little bit of fear. And that's what I was telling you about that book, War by Sebastian Junger. It's like, everyone who does something has a level of fear. It's like, it's what you do with it. It's how you leverage that. And so like the, that those are going to come up. They just naturally are. They do for me. They do for players. They do for, fa they do for everybody. And it's more about like leveraging those uh, and how you use those as strengths. And that was like some, one of the things that, you know, I learned. And for me, what, give me an example of that. So, so how would you like as a head coach yeah. going into a game, playoff game, whatever, could be a regular season game. I, I will get fearful or not scared, but I, I that fear it's that you're talking about. performance anxiety that we talked about. performance anxiety, what yeah. we're talking about, right? I would get part. that before regular season games, yeah. just like I would before the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. So how, how did you go about, lever how do you go about leveraging that performance anxiety? So the, I struggled more with the post game. And what I learned is like, because I, like, if I let somebody down, that like, that bothers me. And so like, if I make a decision by my standards that I feel like I let one of my players down or I let the team down, I can't sleep at night. And so like I had to get past the fact that like every decision you make as a coach is not going to be perfect. Like you can study the film all you want. You can memorize scouting reports. You can build your substitution pattern. You can have your play call frequency by quarter. You can have all this crap figured out. And at the end of the day, I'm a human and I'm going to do something. I'm going to like go against the preparation at some point. or I'm going to trust the preparation that doesn't work. And it's like I had to be able to live with the philosophy that like every decision I make, it's just not going to go well all the time. And that was like an adjustment period because in like everyday life, you make a decision and like, there's really no consequence to it. Like, you know, and so, but in, in, in Maybe your wife gets mad at you. Yeah. Or yeah. And you can yeah, just, that's the you can ignore that. Like you, <laughs> yeah. you can, you can just work ignore that. the text for two hours. <laughs> Sorry, Chelsea. Um, but like during the game, you make one decision, then you're sitting there saying like, damn, like, yeah, everyone's talking about this decision in the fourth quarter, but I screwed up a decision in the third quarter that let them go on an eight oh run. And that's what cost us at the end of the game. So it was learning how to live with that. I'm not perfect. And I'm not going to make the best decision every time. Yeah. Very fortunate to uh, li listen in on your, your post jujitsu uh, debrief with your coach and something he said, and I won't spill all the notes I took on that meeting, but I, he talked about, you're never going to achieve perfection. So we were talking about managing, managing expectations, right? You're never going to achieve perfection. The goal is just to work towards it, yeah. not to achieve it. The goal is to work towards perfection, but you're never going to get perfection. You're never going to make, like, do, did you feel like you had a perfect game? As a player, I never had a perfect game. Doc used to always talk about <laughs> basketball is a game of imperfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, what's funny is like the games that we won, I felt like I did more dumb shit than, than the games <laughs> that we lost. It was like, I remember there was like five games that we lost where I was like, personally, I was like, you know what? Like, 
we didn't win, but like I felt like I coached a decent game tonight. And then there was like five games that we won where I was like, thank God our players played well because I did some dumb stuff during the game and no one's going to know about it because we ended up pulling the game out, you know? So like, it's funny how like you look at it from different sides of it. So yeah, it's definitely that like, you, you just make so many decisions and you just have to surrender to the fact that like, there's a percentage of them that aren't going to go well. Yeah. It's really actually fascinating. Um, a little background uh, for the listeners. Uh, you played at West Virginia for Bob Huggins. You went right into coaching. You were an assistant coach for two D- D2 schools in West Virginia, Glenville State, Fairmont State. Then you went to the G League for a year with the Made Red Claws, returned back to Fairmont State as the head coach, uh, and then moved to Boston as assistant coach. Of course, you're now the head coach. But um, I don't know the answer to this, and 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 this is not just for the listener. But what what were you doing at the D two level that allowed you to first get a G League job and then to get an NBA job? Uh, I tell you, I caught a caught a mean break, and so uh, we went to the Final Four in 2010. Brad was coaching the team. Ronald Norad was the point guard on that team. Ron uh, was working for the Celtics. He leaves the Celtics, and I think he goes to Northern Kentucky. And at that time, Northern Kentucky was either Division Two or they had just turned Division One, and they couldn't qualify for the, the tournament yet, I think. And I was at Fairmont State, and we were like right in the sweet spot of like being able to get in the door with, uh, low, with like low D1 recruits. And I'm sitting there in Indianapolis, and I see Ron walk in with an NKU shirt, and I, and I, I said something effective like, that's the dumbest decision I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I was like, you left the Celtics to go to, to college? Because I was like in college trying to get to the NBA. And uh, he kind of laughed and like we built a really good relationship out of that. Um, so he ends up leaving one of the colleges that he was at and taking the head coach at Long Island Nets. Uh, and he calls me and he's like, I want you to come be my assistant. And so I'm an assistant at Fairmont State. And I'm like, I don't even think twice, I just leave. Probably should have. Um, then like two weeks later, he's like, I can't hire you anymore. So then I like, I don't have, so then I'm not at Fairmont anymore and I can't go to Long Island with Ron. And credit to Ron, like he, I, I don't know like the channels that he called, but he, you know, he put me in touch with like Scott Morrison, who's now in Utah. And uh, Scott uh, ended up like, intru- you know, introducing me to him, interviewing. And so that's how I got to Maine, was like first seeing Ron recruiting, uh, building a relationship with him, him hiring me, then getting fired before I got hired. And then, you know, being able to go to Maine with Scott Morrison. So this was your, your big break was a relationship break. It yes. wasn't, it wasn't because you were doing some crazy shit with your, with your team. I, I doubt I was. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like we were, I was coaching in a gym with like 500 people. We were like, you know, 14 and eight. Uh, and, um, but I, you know, I think it's about relationships. Like I think more times you can, you can sum it up as, but it really comes down to like, who do you know, who do you invest in and, and vice versa? Like, like, you know, Scott and Ron like invested in me, like Ron took a chance on me. Scott took a chance on me without, um, you know, even knowing me you know, because of Ron. Uh, and then this organization took a chance on me because of that. Yeah. You, you, you know this because we, we've talked a bunch. You know, I, there's, a, there's a somewhere in, in my heart, in my brain, there's a, this uh, deep burning desire to, to coach someday. And uh, I think a lot about, you know, I write stuff down. Um, I've got like plays and stuff. But I think a lot about coaching philosophy how I want to talk to my team, um, how I would view end game situations, whatever, like all the stuff that goes into coaching. And, and in some of that, how I view, how I would coach, right, is, is based on coaches I played for and my own playing experience, if that makes sense. What, what, is there anything about your playing experience? Is there anything about Coach Huggins that sort of influenced your coaching philosophy? So I think the, the, the thing hugs really does well is build relationships and you know the one thing that i saw from him was and and you see a lot with him on the sidelines like he'll yell scream you know get in your face but he never brings it past the sidelines and so he has this he has the emotional intelligence to like coach the crap out of you uh push you to the absolute limit and the second the horn goes off and you're, you're you're off the lines he's a father figure and when i watched him have that balance I was like, that can be done anywhere because it's foundationally, it's, it's not about coaching. It's about like love. It's about building relationships. And I really felt that like one of the reasons, one of the things that drew me to want to coach in the NBA was like, can I take that formula and work to build those types of relationships with the, with NBA players? And I think that's the biggest thing I took from him. Um, 2005, St. Louis, final four in St. Louis. I've got to go because, you know, I'm up for a couple of awards or whatever. My team didn't make it. Um, and so one of the nights I went out 
and I, I go to this bar with a couple other guys that are there for awards, guys that weren't playing in the final four or whatever. And Huggy's there. And, you know, I talked to him in the bar or whatever. And I, I think there was like a shuttle that was going back to the hotel or something. And so the bar closes at like two o'clock in the morning and the shuttle's not there. So we're all kind of stranded. This is pre Uber, of course. Yeah. And, you know, none of us knew how to call a taxi, I guess. And so I, I sat there on the sidewalk with, with Huggy for like 30 or 40 minutes. We both put a little skull in <laughs> <laughs> and we just like chopped it up. And ever since then, I'm like, I'm a Bob Huggins fan. Yeah. Like he has that ability to just yeah. really, really connect. I didn't even play for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we just like had this sort of instant connection. Yeah. Like I think it's an, I think it's like from a place of empathy. Like I think when you, you know, like none of us are perfect. Right. And like, like, like that's one of my goals is to like, just live a life of where like, uh, this is who I am. Like, I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. And Huggy has for sure made mistakes. But like when you make mistakes, you're able to use those for like positivity later in life and apply those to relationships that you're in. And so, you know, because you have a guy like Hugs who's been through a lot, he can relate to different people because the people that he's recruiting and coaching, guess what? They also made mistakes. And so I think that's like a huge thing is like if we can get through with a, like the grace, the forgiveness, I don't condone like people like hurting other people or anything, but like if we can get past the initial emotion of like someone hurting someone's feelings or something, there's a positivity that can come from that. And Hugs uses all the experiences he's been through to help the people that he's had. And like, I can give you a list of players on our roster and rosters before, like they come from some really difficult situations. And if Hugs wasn't who he was, he would not have been able to help them the way that he did. Yeah. Empathy is a powerful thing for sure. Um, the, the idea of openly admitting that you're going to make mistakes. I, I really, I, I love that. Um, Tobias Harris and I used to always, he, he was a very black and white person. And, you know, if something went wrong, like, or if somebody was doing something wrong, like he just couldn't get past it. You know what I mean? And he, and he, in some ways we, we were talking about perfection, like he, in some way, and we, I've discussed this with him on the pod, so I'm not saying anything that isn't already out there, but you know, he, in some ways, like if, if it wasn't perfect, it was like really bothering him. And I, and I used to live that way as well. <clears throat> and, and I found that the gray is, is, is like very peaceful. It's very Zen. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this idea of embracing the gray as a player, you're going to make mistakes. And I think sometimes as a player, if you make the same mistakes, continue not continuously, but time and again, uh, there's a narrative that develops around you. Uh, and I think it's the same thing for coaches, right? Uh, this coach is not great in this situation. This coach is not great in that situation. Yeah. Are you ever worried about narratives around you and the like the mistakes you make building to something that like you get now labeled as Joe Missoula, the guy who can't do this. Yeah. The only, the only label I care about is what my players say in my family. And so I don't, I, I don't care about what the labels are. What I don't want is a, the players to believe them and b to, to coach a certain way to where the players don't believe in what my philosophy is. And so, you know, you take an example of something that may happen in a game and I'm sure we'll bring it up or it's like, you know, I'm labeled as the coach that doesn't call a timeout. Yeah, we're going to talk about this. I later. figured we were, so I might as well, I beat you to it. <laughs> right. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, like I, I, I stand by my philosophy. What I, where I have to get better at is in the organization of my philosophy. And that's where I didn't have time as a coach. And so I still believe in certain situations, a timeout is not the best decision where I wasn't good at as a coach was organizing my team properly to take advantage of that situation. I didn't teach the philosophy well enough. I had the philosophy, but I didn't teach it well. And so the narrative doesn't bother me. What bothers me is I didn't do a good job of putting our players in the best possible position to succeed. And that's a goal of mine heading into the season is like, okay, I've had one year, I've built some philosophies, but now I got to double down on my teaching and I got to double down on the organization. And I got to make sure that I stand by the philosophy that we agree on as a team, but then also that I do a great job of organizing our guys to put them in the best possible position. Yeah. Um, I think it was the second game I called. I had a Friday, Sunday game in March. I think it was the Knicks game where you didn't call a timeout. Yeah. And I don't think you guys got a shot off because uh, Tatum ended up catching the ball on the right wing with like two seconds to go. And and then I'm obviously, we're, you know, game four yeah. in Philly, we're not calling timeout. And just to review a little bit, they score. Um, we can talk about the help off the strong side corner all we want, but they, they Harden hits the three and there's time and 
I think there's a lot of coaches who don't call a timeout in that play because then they don't want to get the defensive unit for the other team, right? Yeah. It could have been McDaniels. It could have been DeAnthony Melton, right? They're all of a sudden there in the yeah, game. Yeah. And you got Maxie in the game, right? So you don't call a timeout. Um, there's also what you said after the game, your quotes after the game, you were talking about, you know, I trust my players. I trust mm -hmm. my players in that situation, which, again, I 100% agree with. Um, but I also think, not for you necessarily, but I also think for a lot of coaches um, who sit there for four or five minutes throughout the course of a game, live action, no, no dead balls, right? Mm -hmm. There's no control. And I think for a lot of coaches, they, they like that control at the yeah. end of the game. Yeah, you yeah. Know, there's coaches that just want to call a timeout. Mm -hmm. and I want to draw something up. I yeah. want to be set. I want to be organized. Yeah. And so I think there's this like really tough balance to find between all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you talk about teaching that, I, I, what does that mean specifically? I mean, I just did like, I, the philosophy is right. Like there's, I think there was 10, 11 seconds, 12 seconds or something like I think that. It's 14, 14, 14 to start. Yeah, 14 yeah. to start. If you were to tell me you can guarantee the ball in one of your best players' hands with 14 seconds on the clock to go make a play, you would take that every day of the week. Where I failed as a coach is we didn't have a 14 second play. We didn't have an eight second play to go fast enough. Yeah. So you're so, talking about in a, in a practice throughout yes, the season. Yes. So like I have to get better yeah, at yeah, yeah. practicing that, of organizing that, of giving a, you know, an example of like, hey guys, there's 14 on the clock. This is what we're going to. This is when we have to shoot it by. This is what happens if it goes in. This is what happens if it doesn't. And so, like I said, I had the philosophy, but I didn't properly teach the steps towards executing it. And I think that's where you have to grow. Uh, that's where I have to grow as a coach. But also think, there are times where you do have to call it. Um, the one that sticks out to me is at home versus the Warriors where we're down three and there's no timeout and it's like bedlam and smart kicks at the JB and it goes in and after the game, Kerr, Steve Kerr is like, we really thought they were going to call a timeout. Right? So there's like, there's always the other side of that, but we were more organized. Um, and so it's just about, it's just about believing in something, but then teaching it, organizing it and working at it. And we, we just have to get better. I have to get better at that. Yeah. Um, that same weekend in March, by the way, you guys lose to Brooklyn. Uh, after having a big lead and in the pregame and I've, I think I've used this on the podcast before in the pregame interview with you, when we asked you about Friday night, you said, we just got out mathed. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I love this. I love this. When did you embrace, we're, we're going to talk about the three point shooting state, but just analytics in general yeah. and, and, and not just using your gut and, mm -hmm. and your eyes as like the guide for everything. When, when did that start? So let's, this, this, is a, this is a loaded question, right? That was the, that game was when I felt like I let my team down emotionally because we didn't have... The Brooklyn game. Yeah. We didn't have... We, I, two things are true. Two things can be true at the same time. I don't know if you believe that, but I, I love to believe that. Of course. So we did get out math and I let our team down emotionally because we didn't have the proper tools to handle momentum swings. So from that game forward, we started putting together momentum edits and we started studying momentum within NBA games. And so maybe every other day we would have 10 to 12 clips of different pockets of the game, no matter what quarter it was, where it's like, this is why this was a close game in the fourth quarter. You're up 10 with three minutes to go at the end of the third and you give up a 5-0 run. Now, like being down five and start the fourth is way different than being down 10 to start the fourth. And closing quarters, ending quarters, uh, all that stuff came from that game. And so I can easily say this now. I'm kind of, I'm, I, le I learned from that one, right? So we really made a conscious effort. I was like, that's the game where I was like, hey, I really screwed my team. But we did get out math. And so I'm sitting in there and it came from, so when I was a D2 assistant at Glenville my first year, I had a counter and I was counting possessions. And a coach in the other league was like, what are you doing? And like, I was just sitting there with like a counter session go by I'd get it and like I would do all the math from Dean Oliver's book at halftime and I would have it I would do it after the game and I would log the possession and then I would do it every five games and so I was just literally counting possessions so that's that's kind of like where it started is at the D2 level where you can do anything you want like you can do anything you want in division two like there's a hundred to five hundred people at the game you're never on the bottom ticker if you wanted to you know Play five on four. Play five on four. You <laughs> right. would do it and nobody would care. Like, so it was like, it was, that's where I like became creative and innovative. Um, and so that's kind of where it started. 
who did someone prod you to count the possessions or you were just like you had read Dean Oliver's book and you were like oh let me let me just employ some math here in so terms I'd read of our, Dean our coaching book. philosophy I'd read Dean Oliver's book and then there was a team in our league called West Liberty that dominated uh and the coach is now at Nova Southeastern and he dominates there and everyone in the league was trying to figure out how to keep up with these guys they would full court press the entire game they would only shoot layups and threes. They would only force turnovers. They would crash five guys. So like he was ahead of the game on doing what we're doing in the NBA now. And I was like, the only way to beat these guys is to like keep, like figure out a way to keep up with them. And so that's kind of where it started. was like, what are the mathematical advantages that these guys are getting by crashing five guys, by pressing the entire game, by forcing turnovers, by shooting threes and free throws and layups? Like what mathematical advantages are they getting? So it went down like this deep dive of like, so I was in the conference for five years and that's kind of where it evolved for me i assume now in the nba that within this organization there's no pushback to this philosophy i mean last year i I don't have the numbers right in front of me but i know the entire season it was you and the warriors one and two for most three-point attempts three-point makes i don't know where you guys ended up on percentage but i think they're i don't know yeah it was it was high but like i know it was one and two with you and the warriors um and we we had chris finch on like a month ago and we, we were talking about this because there, there's um, there's fans. I think there's players, too, that kind of push back on this. You know, this notion of, like, threes and layups. Um, but then also you having sort of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and, and giving them creative freedom mm-hmm. to take tough shots. And a lot of times those are twos. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do, you, how do you sort of communicate the philosophy of this is how we want to play? And not only that, just how do you hold people accountable if there is a shot or a possession that doesn't go the way that you want? So first it starts with them. Like we have one of the smartest locker rooms, uh, a very aware locker room to how the game is being played, how the game has evolved. Like top to bottom, everybody just likes basketball and thinks basketball. And I, you know, we never really talked, like we never talked about it. I think we have a group mindset of like, we're just going to do what makes sense. And so, and we, I would have individual conversations with each guy about like, Hey, how do you feel about this? Right? Like, how do you feel about taking this type of shot in this situation? And they would give their thing. I'd say, okay, well, you know, here's how I feel about it. Like, this is how maybe taking this shot. Like to me, there's certain players in the league that even if they miss the other coach gets nervous. So I was like, if you pass this shot up, you're, you're letting the other coaching staff off the hook because they're, they're just waiting to adjust. Like they're waiting to adjust. And I said, sometimes you have to take certain shots so that the other team starts thinking, damn, he just missed two in a row. He's got, he, like, that's Jason Tanner or Jalen Brown. Like he's knocking the next one down. We got to be ready. Right. And so I think that's a part of shot selection. Um, but I'm grateful to the guys because they're smart and we just kind of have simple conversations about do what makes sense. And heading into last season, you know, we played double big two years ago. I think heading into the last season, Rob might have been out at the beginning of the year. And so we chose to put Al at the five, and X5 was on Al. And so what do bigs like to do? Help. So if bigs help, you have three two-on-ones all over the floor. And if you have two-on-ones and you're playing small, you either have a wide-open shot or the guy next to you has a wide-open shot. So it didn't become like this where only, like, I felt like last year that was the best possible formula to put ourselves in position to win. Right. I think, and so I think this is, the, this is like the key point about, uh, to me at least about analytics and coaching is like, uh, or even philosophy in general. It's like, yeah, hey, I want to, I want to play a certain way. I want these type of shots, but then to some degree you have to adjust your personality. And it's funny you bring up Al starting the season at the five, because in the conversation with Chris Finch, we were talking about Cat being moved to the five from the, or being moved to the four from the five where he spent his entire career to that point playing in space yeah. because the fives are always the help guy. Fives mm-hmm. are in drop. Yeah. Now he's attacking a closeout with a seven footer and he's able to drive by and, and score mm-hmm. yeah. or, or get an open three. And those opportunities, they happen, but not as frequently, right? Cause yeah. four man's going to switch, whatever. So I, I, I do think there's a lot of it is figuring out like, <clears throat> all right, this is my team. This is the best group I can put out there last year to start the season. It was out at the five. You guys played a certain way. It ended up, and it just took off. Like, yeah, it wasn't like I came in the season like saying, "Guys, we're only shooting threes. And you didn't come to the season. Got, there's not a quota. <laughs> yeah, like, I, like, I've had some players tell me like, "I got a quota, right? Do, there's not there, a quota. There's like, not a you're quota. not saying we need 43s. No, but I am paying attention to the sharp margin. And so we'll go to come full circle to the Nets game. Is like we were getting all layups, 
and they were bricking threes. And I'm sitting there going like, this is not going to go well. <laughs> like, because like, if you get easy baskets, what does the brain tend to say? Oh, we're just going to get these all night. And I know Jock Vaughn, and I listened to a lot of his press conferences, like he will double down on the math and double down on what makes sense. And so they started the game two for 20 from three, and we started the game like 10 for 14 from two. And I'm like, we're screwed because they're not going to stop shooting. Now, if they stop shooting, then we're in good shape, but they're going to keep launching and we're going to keep thinking that we're just going to get layups all night. They're going to make their adjustment defensively. When they make their adjustment defensively, how can we keep pushing the pace to score? And at that time, like we didn't have the curveball of like forcing turnovers. So like it was like half court execution, transition execution. So that was like the sweet spot of like they're two for 20 from three, we're 10 for 14 from two. How's this going to go? Right. And so they just kind of did it. But what's funny is like this year, that might not make sense for our team. Like with the addition of Porzingis, we have the chance to play small. We have the chance to play double big. X5 might not be an L. You know, we, we don't know. But because we, ha the matchups, like the matchups are going to be completely different this year than they were last year. And so again, like you, you kind of start with the framework of like what makes the most sense because there's going to be natural mismatches on the court now when Porzingis is out there if X5 isn't on him. And so now it's about recognizing what type of shots are we going to get with the mismatches we create with our players that we have now. And I think you just go from there. Makes sense. What, for for Jason, who has been first team All NBA the last two years. One more thing on that. So three yeah, yeah. years ago, when Quinn was in Utah, we lost to the Jazz at home, like by thirty, maybe. Can't remember. This was like my, either my first year or the second year with no crowd. And I looked at the box score, and they were launching, and like we were like executing. And I looked back, and I was like, not only did we get our ass kicked tonight, we got mathematically destroyed. <laughs> Because they just dominated the shot margin and they dominated the three point margin. And so you have to pay attention to that. Yeah. I I started to feel it more and more by like 2015, 2016. Like it just you would I would be in the middle of a game. And this is when I was still playing with the Clippers and like, you know, we'd have four straight possessions. Uh B Blake and CP would shoot mid range shots and and let's say we made two. Yeah. Right. And then the other team's coming down. They have four straight possessions shooting threes. And they let's say they make two, right? It's like an eight-point game turns to a 10-point game. A 10-point game turns to a 14-point game. And you're just like, at, I didn't use the phrase, we're getting out math. <laughs> but I was like, yeah, we got no chance. Like, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's just, like, it's just a, it's, it's, it's an equation. It's funny, too, because the Rockets, like, that, that, that was one of the games I specifically remember that happening. We were playing in L.A. And then you see, like, Game seven against the Warriors, uh, when when Chris was out, uh, I think that was eighteen, and they missed like twenty seven threes in a row. It's like that's a that's to me that's the anomaly. Yeah, right. Yeah, how that happened it, since? It, it, uh, no, twenty. That's what I'm saying. Like a team shooting sixty percent from three, like or fifty percent from three on forty five attempts, like that that uh, that to me happens maybe not on a nightly basis, but it certainly happens two or three times a week. Yeah. Like the anomaly is like, if you're going to buy into this strategy, the anomaly is like, I'm willing to, I'm willing to buy, go fully, fully in on this strategy, knowing that like once every thousand games, you're yeah. going to miss 25 in a row. Yeah. Jazz. I, I can remember watching games with the jazz yeah. where it's like, they missed eight in a row, but like they're still kind of in the game and they're going to hit three in a row at some point and they're back in it. Yeah. I mean, so the challenge for me is it's a double sided coin. Right. Like this is where my brain struggles. This is where I struggle to communicate as a coach sometimes. The effort, like the effort, physicality, toughness piece, that gets you in the door. Like I, I like I did a poor job of like um re-emphasizing that sometimes throughout the year last year as the as the head coach. And I think like what you emphasize as a coach, like that was another adjustment was like as a head coach, it's like you are what you emphasize, you know? And so like I don't I feel like me personally, like if it's effort, physicality, toughness, that, that's an admission ticket. That gets you in the building. Like we shouldn't have to talk about that if you, if you really want to win, right? Like maybe a couple times you have to remind the guys. And so I struggle with going back to that, reminding that. But it's like a double-sided coin of like there's the effort, the physicality, and the toughness, which gets you in the door. And then there's the execution approach about how are we going to manipulate this game and do both. And so, like, it kind of goes back to, like, duality. Like, you have to do both. You got to freaking play hard. But then you also got to do what makes sense.
By the way, I, I'm I'm taking notes on some stuff to, you say to follow up on, and I'm also taking notes on stuff you say that I'm gonna then put in my binder later <laughs> on. And it might I, not work. I don't know. No, no, no. But I love that your team is what you emphasize. I love that. Yeah, that's, I mean, like, that's, and you know that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen, that's a good. But that's a good like mantra. I that, like that. That's I the like that. that's the other interesting part about like when you're an assistant, you spend seven years getting ready to be a head coach. You build all these binders. You have all these notes. You go to all these coaching clinics. You're like, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. You don't know what. I'm not going to coaching clinics. Bro. You don't know what situation you're gonna. You don't know what situation you're gonna fall into. You don't know what ten nuggets you're gonna take from your ten years of preparing and what you're gonna do. And so, like, I must have read you are you emphasized fifteen times from when I first started coaching to like the day before I became the coach. And then, like, shit happens. You just forget about that one little detail that you are you emphasize. And like, and that to me, like, what I learned about myself was like, I'm stubborn to be like. We're going to talk about defense on day one. And then we're not going to talk about it again because it's just so obvious that you have to play it. Like, if you really want to win, you have to do it. Like, you don't have a choice. Now, we're going to drill it every day. But like, if I have to come in every day and be like, guys, defense is the most important thing, then like, to me, to me, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying I'm a little wacky. But to me, it's like, you brush your teeth every day. It's just common sense, right? Like, just, you just do it. It's, it's, Maybe it's because I sucked at offense and I only played defense. <laughs> I think that's what it is. I sucked at offense, so I couldn't pay attention to it. So I right. only had to play defense. It was my only chance of like survival. I feel like there was a decent amount of chatter about your team's defense dropping off last year. Yeah. You still ended up with the number two defense in the regular season. What were the areas where, you know, you look, I'm, sh I'm sure you watched a ton of film on last year as you prepare for this season, but like, what were the areas where you're like, all right, this, these are the things we didn't do well. So again, starts with me. Like I, I, so when I, when I you talk about collecting data, when I got the job, I, the, 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 the final line of data that I came from, this has been a top five defense since I've been here. We know how to do that. Our offense has fluctuated throughout the season, throughout fourth quarters. It's fluctuated up and down since I've been here. So can we keep this, the stable? Like, can we be top five in defense like we have been even before I got here. And then can we like weaponize the offense? And then can we get to a situation where like super well balanced? So that was kind of like my thought. And so like it failed at times because of my lack of emphasis, because of my stubbornness to just be like, why do I have to talk about that? We should just do it. Um, and so, you know, I learned that about myself. But then I think where we weren't good was we put so two things. We didn't force turnovers. And we didn't have a curveball. And that's what I learned about coaching um, in the playoffs. I learned two things in the playoffs and really at like the end of game playoff things is analytics do go out the window in the playoffs because the sample size is much smaller. And so you have to find a better balance of like, this is what makes sense, but you also have to do this. And so that's kind of like what, that's like the number one thing I took from last year um, was that balance, right? Like, I think they go out the window at some point. Um, and then the second thing is like, you have to have a curveball. And for, for two years, two, three years, we, our curveball, we didn't have one. It was just like switch, guard the ball and individual defense. And that was better two years ago than last year. Um, but you have, you have to be able to do, go to something different during the game that changes the momentum. And it's really, really hard to just switch, switch, switch all the time. It puts a ton of pressure on your team. And so I would say we got to do a better job of forcing turnovers and we have to, we, we, we got to emphasize, got to force turnovers. We have to have a curveball. Interesting. Um, for, I was going to ask you before you, you gave the, uh, but I love the defense. jazz source. I, I, I know you love like I, That's the only thing I could do. So I, that's why I like, uh, Joe, I, I mean, <laughs> I Duke, sucked at Duke, everything 2010 else. final four, Duke, <laughs> Duke won. I remember. So I got to tell you this funny Duke story. So 2006, we go to the sweet 16. We beat Duke in DC and me being me like honorary, you know, idiot kid at times like we're never gonna play duke again like i don't even belong here like we have a chance to go to sweet 16 like can't grow up or what out my teammate comes up to me he's like i'll give you a hundred dollars if you slap the floor in front of duke's bench at any point in time during the game and i was like done i'm doing that and so at some point during that game like i think we go on a run and i'm right in front of duke's bench slap the floor greg paul drives right by me for a layup <laughs> <laughs> right I would, by me <laughs> i would actually like to know if like there's probably some wacko Duke fan, and I mean that in, in an endearing way, by the way. Like just a true crazy who uh, would be willing to go back 
to like the 1980s and find every televised Duke game, record how many, like every possession with a floor slap, and then what the points per possession <laughs> on defense. <laughs> Because it always felt like every time we slapped the floor, somebody would score. I definitely felt that. <laughs> yeah. I definitely felt that. Um, uh, for for Jason and, and Jalen, um, you know, again, guys, J- Jason's last two years, first team All-NBA. Jalen was uh, All-NBA last year as well. Um, what's the next step for them in the evolution of their careers? Yeah, I think, one, like, just continue to grow as as leaders and as people and as players, which, like, they don't get the credit they deserve for who they are as people. I really believe that. Like there's a, there's like three reasons why I came into the NBA. Number one was I feel like there's the most misunderstood company in the world. And everybody just thinks because you make a ton of money and you play a really cool sport that like, you're just supposed to be a certain type of way. And those two guys amongst our whole team, but like those two are as high character as you can possibly get. And it starts there. Like that's why I really believe every single year we have a chance to win because of the character of our best players. Um, and they're, and then their work ethic, like they're always opening to grow. Um, and I think the biggest area of growth for them, you know, with our roster now is like, how do they, how do they express who they are as leaders? Um, and it's going to look different for each of them. Like, I, you know, you saw Tatum say the other day, like, I'm not Kevin Garnett. He's not, but he's just as good of a leader in a different way. And so we have to create an environment to where he feels the freedom to lead in that way. And Jalen took on ownership and leadership with his defense in the Philly series. And so like taking that as the leadership step of like, okay, like I know I can do this. I'm going to be this now. And they both have publicly said it, like this is what they want to do. So like they're, they, they grow every day, um, which makes it really special to, to work here. I said this during the playoffs last year. Um, and I, and I didn't mean this in like a, a negative way towards either of them, but I, t- I talked about there, there's, an inherent redundancy um, because they're both big wings who can shoot and handle. There's not a lot. I mean, you could, I guess, run pick and rolls with them, but there's not a lot you can do as like a tandem, right? Yeah. Like a like a two man game, mm-hmm. right? So, like I I I think I use the example of uh, LeBron and AD or Steph and Draymond or Jokic and Murray, right? It's, it's it, it, and and so like, maybe like having... are they are there creative ways like where the two of them could like be in action together outside of the V set, which is you know. The horns. Yeah. yeah. You, generally speaking, yeah, you, I guess you got, you call it horns. I call it V or V2, mm-hmm. whatever. But the horn set, right? So generally speaking, I think most of the time you run that, two of the two of them are one of the three people involved. In yeah, that. two and, of the three. So I think, one, I think there are creative ways, which I think we got to last year, which I feel like that's why we saw a really great version of Jalen with his, his growth as a pick and roll ball handler, like his growth as a screener last year. I think Tatum's like, he grows as a screener every day. Um, he's getting comfortable, uh, handling and pick and roll. So like, I think there are creative ways, but I also think you have to have a curveball. You have to have something else to go to. And I think that's what the addition of Porzingis will give us is like our shot selection is going to look different at times this year. And if you look at our late game execution, it's not that we're not trying not to execute. It's that we don't have, we didn't have a way to change the momentum of the game. Um, because in a, in, like you have to be able to post, you have to get to the free throw line, you have to make really hard shots. And so I think with the addition of Porzingis, he will take the pressure off of those two guys and allow the space and freedom for them to do what they do. Also give us a curveball of posting, nail ISO. And so it just changes what we're going to be able to do. Um, but I think it frees them. Uh, and I think he's going to make a big difference for us. Yeah. Um, we're recording this two days after... Uh... Damian, Damian Lillard got traded to Milwaukee. Um, you're you're sort of as a coach of a team in the Eastern Conference. Not not like talking about Dame, but you're just like reaction to that, like where a team who has you know won a championship two years ago, like all of a sudden gets a Damian Lillard. You know, it's it's like what is what is that sort of feeling? What is that chatter like in, 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 with 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 the coaches? I'll give you exactly what what it is. He's a great player. They're a great team. We don't have time, like we don't have time to worry about that. And here's why I say that: as a young coach, like taking over the way I did, I really, I, I can say this, like I really wanted the number one seed. Look how that turned out for the number one seed last year. So be careful what you ask for, is what I would say. Like I spent a lot of time, like man, we got to get the one seed, like we got to get the one seed. Then we lost it, and I was like, ah, oh, shit, like we lost it. And then it was like, okay, well, then it ended up like, well, the one seed just went down to the eight seed. So like, and so you end up thinking like, you don't, you just don't know, like, and I think like people don't say that enough, like. 
Like, what if we would have got the one seed and lost to the eight seed? Like, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. So, like, thank you, God, for, like, protecting us from the one seed. Coach, I had to tell you, but you did lose the eight seed. <laughs> <laughs> I meant as the, as the one seed in the first round. No, no, no. You know what I mean? So, like, it's be careful what you ask for, and you really don't know what you're... So, like, to... That really taught me something last year. It was like, look, there's so much at stake. I just don't have, I can't worry about what's going on around because then I'm losing sight of like what we actually have. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I knew you were going to answer it that way, by the <laughs> way, but I, I, I want to make, cause I, every time I, I can make this point, I want to make this point. Cause you see the, you, I don't know how much you're not on social media, but you see on social media, like <clears throat> this team's going to be scary or like this, it's scary, you know, James Harden, scary hours in Brooklyn mm -hmm. or whatever. And, you know, I always, tell people like the perspective as like a player or the perspective for for coaches is just like we we have to just control what we can control and if and if your best is better than our best you know it's all we can do right yeah. so you, the 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 approach has just got to be like i got to worry about my team i got to worry about the locker room yeah i wasn't um, great at that at all time i showed like yeah. you can't control like we i we couldn't even control getting the one seed like we lost like two games and milwaukee won 20 in a row so like there was nothing we could have done it's just if you go through like if you go through the season or these situations where it's like oh that trade makes them like better than us or like if we don't get the one seed we're not going to the finals it's like you, you don't know you have no idea what i do know is like we've had the best month of preseason since i've been here from top to bottom of buy in from like our top players from buy in of our second unit from buy in of our young guys from our staff like when i i tried to come in this gym as much as I could over the last month and a half. And it was just a different type of feeling. And so like, if I spend more time worrying about those things and not appreciating what we have, one, I'm doing the players a disservice. And two, like, I'm not going to be as effective at what we do. So like, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be a nightmare to play against, but my job is to make us a nightmare to play against too. And we'll see what happens when two nightmares play against each other. Right. Right. Kind of anecdotally to this. Um, cause you were, you said the word curveball a couple times and you know i was talking about the two-man game and it's like dame and Giannis, Jokic, murray right they're probably not like great answers to to how to defend that um when you're in a coach's meeting prepping a scout game plan for a regular season game or let's say you're playing the nuggets or whatever mm -hmm. versus a playoff game like how different are those meetings in terms of the back and forth and, and just like the decision making on, all right, we're going to be in a drop, you know, it, warriors, right? Warriors finals, you know, you, when you were an assistant, like we're gonna be to drop this guy. Oh, now we got to be up. Oh, now we gotta, we gotta switch like the back and forth on that. I'm, I'm just, cause I, I never got to never got to be in coaches meetings and I'm always fascinated because all we get is all right, here's the game plan. You get like the final thing. Like there yeah, could have the been, been a fist fight in the coach's room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, we got to yeah. limp to the no, line. Like, this Red is Brown's really... <laughs> coaches meetings for like three hours. So. <laughs> well, three things. One, I love to debate and argue. So like, I'll sit there all day and s screw with you to make sure we get, get it right. Number two, and I, I would say one of the things I am, one of the things I'd like to say I'm pretty good at is ignoring the emotion and being able to sit in something that I believe in. And for like, whether it's a playoff game or a regular season game, like if a scout says we're doing this, if it's not, if it's not effort or anything else, we're not making an adjustment because I know what the other side of that adjustment brings. Now there are times when you have to make the adjustment and that's where the curveball comes into, but I'm willing to sit in an uncomfortable space a little bit longer because I know what the other side of the coin looks like because of our staff and the homework that we did. So I would say that as like for a regular season game. Um, for playoffs, that's where I struggle with a balance of like what analytics versus what makes sense for this game. You know, this is what it, this is what it says you should do over a long period of time against this team. This is what this team is doing. It happened in the Atlanta series where it's like they weren't a great point shooting team like statistically, but when Quinn came, he just completely changed the philosophy and they weren't going to stop shooting. So it was like, we're going to have to decide, like the variance is going to take over at some point. Um, so I think balancing the analytics to like what's happening in this three game series, um, is really, really important. And then, like you said, being able to have a curveball, um, I think, I think that's kind of like what goes into it. Uh, but you gotta be able to live in that space for a little while and you gotta be able to coach the emotion of your guys because they hear, they see everything yeah. that's going on. And sometimes the most uncomfortable thing is to do what you should do. Right. You have to be willing to say this, like, 
All right, here's the game plan. We're going to mean a drop, Jokic and Murray. And you can't, after two plays, after Murray hits two pull-up jumpers, be like, fuck, why, why are we in this fucking drop, yeah, right? You, yeah. you just like, have to, like, all right, now we're switching. It's like, because my only thing with the adjustment is like, l- listen, we go through every adjustment plan you can. Once you adjust, you're screwed. Because it, like, it could go well. Well, not actually, necessarily screwed, well, but like, no, 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 I know, I know what you're you saying. Know what I'm saying? Like, I, I know exactly spot. what you're saying, but yeah. But there's also the, you should have the ability, I think at times to like give different coverage to great players. You right? have to, you, you can never give yeah, yeah, them yeah, yeah. the same. Yeah. The, the balance is like, how long do you live in that one space, you know, against different guys. But like you said, like there's also the long game, like, you know, we'll take a look at like, okay, this is what we're going to do in the first three quarters, but this is what you're going to do in the fourth quarter. Or like, sometimes it's like, you see the guy's sub pattern ending and it's like, if, you, if you're going to adjust now, he's not going to be in the game for another minute. So then you've just adjusted, not, you know, so like it's, it's just a fine line and you're constantly assessing. I think a lot of the adjusting also has to do with how you're, what you're doing on offense. Like if you're playing, if you're playing the game a certain type of way, um, I think that also plays into it, you know, so I'm probably an overthinker. I think there's a layer. No, 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 that makes like, sense. There's a layers of adjustment there, and, but you have to have a package of different stuff to go to. And I think if you look at us over the last few years, like switching was dynamite for us. But if you were to look at our team over the last three years, like what would you say our curveball was? I don't think you had one. Exactly. And so yeah. that that's what I learned. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna wrap up here. I, I did want to ask uh just about Marcus. Um, because you know, we we talked about KP uh, a few times and as an outside person, right? And someone who played against Marcus uh and competed, I would use that term very heavily too. Oh yeah. <laughs> like competed against Marcus. Um, it felt like the sort of that, that defensive identity, um, and, and in some ways, like from the outside again, the, the cultural identity mm-hmm. and and uh and that sort of thing, like he helped to really drive that and establish yeah. that. For years. And, and and so like how how are you approaching replacing that uh with this group? You don't replace it. Like I think that would be somewhat disrespectful to say like the guy's a he was a defensive player of the year he's been the uh, an anchor for our team for some time now you don't replace it you just reinvent you just find new ways to be great like there's not one way to be great i always like so the thing i learned is like out of the top five defenses it's like miami gives up the most above the break in corner threes they're top in defense every year we give up the least we're top in defense every year so there's never one way to be great i think you have to build a mindset and then you have to build a system which what works for your roster and so there's no like coming in saying we got to replace this guy. It's like, no, we got to reinvent to what our roster is. But we have to also, you know, develop an identity and a mindset of what that's going to look like. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on one last thing before we go. And that's that's going back to the late game thing. It was one of the notes I took when you were with your um, jujitsu coach. And you guys were explaining to me the, the procession of the kill, right? The yeah, procession yeah. of victory in in jujitsu strategy and sort of getting closer and closer to the win is oftentimes when you lose when you lose yeah. because you hold on to it and you lose mobility and flexibility and i'm so fascinated by this in the yeah. nba where a team can play a certain way for 45 minutes and then for 3 minutes they play a completely different way in a We'll call it a clutch game, yeah. a five, six point game, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm never surprised when they lose. I'm never surprised. And for a team like you, who for a lot of the game is relying on a lot of spacing, a lot of ball movement, pace, pace, pace yeah. right, to then slow down. It just, it, it, not just singling you out and your no, team. I mean, it's, I, it's been a, this, by the way, this, I said the same thing about the to the 22 team, like. I, I just, it's always, it's always fascinating to me that teams across the league do this. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to start with like, I do think you have to have again, a curveball, And that's where I think with our roster now, like, you know, late game, also analytics go out the window. So like, we don't like the post, but you got to get the ball close to the basket. You got to try to get to the free throw line. You have to, you have to make tough shots. Not like, you know what I mean? Like not come down and shoot like a fadeaway, but you got to make a tough shot. And so I think it, it is a little bit of a different mindset to like, it's a free flowing game at a certain point. You know, what, what's the space of keeping it free flowing versus executing? And so like, I think we, you know, with our roster now, I think we'll be able to 
give some different looks to that game to put some pressure. Right, you, have, you have you have more options for the execution piece. Yes. Right. Yeah. The, but we're talking about the mindset piece. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful principle that like a really good friend of mine talked to me about that you know my coach came up with where it's like the closer you are to winning is like that's right at the sweet spot of when you're about to lose because the energy changes. You're hanging on for dear life and the other team is in survival mode and it's like who can make you know who can you know it's like and so I think you have to practice that. I think you have to be aware of that. Um, an eight point game with five minutes to go is in the NBA with so many possessions and how fast the game is like you have to you can't be passive in those situations. Um, and so I, that really helped me that, you know, that principle today. And, you know, it's something that we'll look to, to look into more. Okay, Joe, uh, last question, the rowback question reminder to our viewers, you can use code old on rowback.com for 20% off your first purchase. That's R H O B A C K.com code old. Um, we didn't mention your dad who played, uh, and coached. How did, how did your dad inspire you as a player and as a coach? I mean, he, Mindset. Like that's the number one word um, when I think of him that comes to mind was like mindset. And he just brought it every single day. Uh, he brought it to to the family. He brought it to the community. He brought it to the people that he coached. And uh, he taught me the the mindset approach where it's like, if there's something going on, it's because of the way you're thinking about it or you're not doing enough. And like everything is about a fundamental principle to your mindset. And you can't change until you change that. And um, what's funny is like, and I, I think I've said this a few times, I got this job as an assistant and he got diagnosed with cancer in the same week. And so the duality of handling both of those things, I did, it took me until the playoffs to grieve it because it was one of the hardest things I had to go through without him. Like everything that I went through in life that was hard, like marriage, you know, kids, college, mistakes I made, he was there for. And, you know, that was the first time where I was like, damn, like he would be here at every game. And like this, like this, like we made it as a family. Like we're here. Like we grew up an hour away. Like this is the coolest moment, and he's not here. And like, it, like I grieved him a lot during the playoffs because of the emotion of what it means to what he did for me, what he would do if he was here. Like I could hear his voice, like after games, like just the fuck up, <laughs> <laughs> or like you're being soft, or like figure it out, or like it's a mindset. Like it's it's that simple. And so like that had unbelievable. And that's, that's like the number one goal I try to be for my kids is like, if I give them anything, it's faith and mindset. It, it's funny. I, I, I don't talk to my dad that frequently. Um, I never have just not, not like a, a call somebody on the phone type yeah. person. Um, but I love him. He's like my hero. And I don't talk to coach K who has had, you know, probably the second most influence on my life, but the two of them, I always, I always say this, like the two of them, there's not a day that goes by where I don't think of something I learned from them yeah. and apply it to my life. Yeah. It's like, that's the impact that mm -hmm. the two of them have had on me. Oh, like there's, since he's, since he's been gone, like there'll be times where I'm just walking around. I'm like, God, I really turned into this guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not yet, <laughs> but you're hundred percent right. Like whether it's a saying, a thought, like one of our action principles this year is figure it out. And that's from him. Cause he would never give me an answer. He would just be like, just figure it out. And I'm like, you know what dad, like this time I actually might need an answer. Like it's not going well for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're hundred percent right. All right. I love it. I appreciate it. Uh, Joe, we're going to give you some road back here too. All right. I love it. Coach, this has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I had yeah, fun. That was fun. <laughs>